So yesterday we went over the moral fonts and we ended the class talking about that scenario that I had up on the screen and then we applied the optic, the intention and the circumstance to that. That's how the Roman Catholic moral theologian would look at a moral act to determine its goodness or its evil. Now I'm going to show you competing ethical systems. It's just a real quick look at each one of them and then I'll give you an example from each one of them and then when we're done, I will put that scenario back up and we will evaluate that scenario through the lens of proportionalism, consequentialism, the ontology, and situational ethics. Okay? So it's the same format for each slide. I tell you what it is, who it is, I give you two bullet points about it, its method, and then the critique. These ethical systems are not as simplified as I'm presenting them to you. They're quite nuanced often. There's many, you want to say, subtleties that we can discuss within them. And there are other people besides the name I put up there. But I tried to give you the person who was probably at least more prominently known to have uh, either you know, held it or advanced it. And I'm giving you what I would say is a simple approach to each system. So proportionalism, it weighs out the goods and necessary evils. So think of a, you know, think of a scale. They're going to put the goods and the evils on the scale, and whichever one drops down, they're going to say that's your best course of action. Okay? And Jeremy Bentham was one of the two proponents, the two major ones anyway. So what they're really after is maximum happiness. Now, they're not defining happiness, okay? It's really almost understood as what you think it to be. You know, what will bring you pleasure. It's, they're probably we'd call it secular happiness. And it's looking for everybody affected, and you know, they're trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. So that's uh, actually a, a hedonistic approach. But most people are going to say, well, what's so wrong with that? I mean, I don't want to maximize pain and minimize pleasure, okay? Well, we wouldn't say that either, but there's still other things that we have to consider here. So there's always some positives in these, and there's also some negatives. The method they employ is this is going to compare and evaluate all the possibilities available for that moral choice. Okay? It's going to compare and evaluate all the possibilities available for that moral choice. So that's good. It takes a lot of things into consideration. It doesn't just zero in on one. It's taking a lot of things into consideration so we could say that that's a plus but there's criticisms to be had. One, this does not recognize an objective good. It's weighing out the goods and the evils, but it doesn't recognize an objective good, or we'd say an intrinsic evil. Okay, I guess that's what it's supposed to end. It does not recognize an objective good or an intrinsic evil. If it does, it still doesn't make it part of the criteria. This one, I think you'll find, is even more critical or more damaging, I think. How do you weigh out pleasures and pains? What scale do you use? If, if I'm doing something that's good for me and it's bad for you, how do I put a quantity on your pain and some sort of quantity on my pleasure? You don't need to know, but we would say it's these things are incommensurable, all right? So let me give you an, a for instance. We have a 28-year-old uh, woman who's on her fifth child, each one from a different father. She can't support them. They're all on welfare. These kids are going to grow up fatherless. They're becoming a burden to the community. They're not going to get any attention that most of the other two-parent families get when they go to school. So the state steps in and says, this woman obviously cannot control herself. We're going to force sterilize her. All right? Now, they would weigh all that out. They would say, well, what are the goods that are happening here? Well, the goods are, you know, no more children that are going to be running amok, um, no more burden on society, and it'll go down the list. You can think of it. And then, obviously, the burden is, or the pain will be hers. She loses uh, autonomy or sexuality. So they're going to weigh it out, and they're going to say, you know, it is a pain and burden for her, but sorry, the proportion goes to the good that's going to be done for the community and the children. 
So a proportionalist would say that's a good way to go with this. All right. Um, you'll see after the after the next ethical system, I'm going to show you, you know, why even further some of that's hard to really come up with such clear uh, when you say consequences. Okay. Yes. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Um, it's the report. Okay. Now, all the possibilities available for that particular moral act. Okay. Just for that one particular moral act. Okay, the next one is consequentialism. These are often put together sometimes because they are both what they call utilitarian ethics. I'm offering to them separately because there is some nuance between them, all right? The proponent for this is Saint, oh my God, John Stuart Mill. I don't even know where that came from. The ethic states that we're going to determine what is right in any particular act just by how good the consequences are, okay? So this one's almost like a like a like a crass, you know, what good comes out of it. If it's good, then it really doesn't matter how we do it. You'll see that's sort of, well not sort of, it is a way to say it. So their goals are to maximize the good consequences, and if you've ever heard the phrase the end justifies the means, this is it. So uh, you know, a person may ask themselves, you know, I really didn't study for the test. This is a really big, you know. Uh, percentage of my grade, if I cheat on this test, I know cheating's wrong, but I'm going to get a good grade, it's going to get me a scholarship to college, okay, those are good things, you know, th those are good consequences, so I'm not going to really be concerned with how I got those, okay? That's the end justifies the means. The method they would employ, if they look at a particular act, is they say, let's, let's not consider the morality of the means. We're not worried if we have to lie to get what we want. We're not worried if we have to cheat. I mean, you could probably be extreme and say we're not worried if we have to kill somebody to get what we need, okay? We have to rob somebody. We're going to look at the happiness that the result is going to produce. And if it's a good thing, then we're going to call that licit, all right? Then we're going to call that licit. Now, the criticisms of this, first of all, is any evil may be employed to have a good result. You're breaking the first principle of morality. Do good and avoid evil. And if you're a Christian, this is absolutely out. The Bible's very clear. You may never do evil that good may come of it. So even though by you staying aground and not cheating, getting a bad grade and maybe losing scholarship money, that was still a good, even though it did bring some pain. We're not weighing it out. We're not saying the end justifies the means. This second one is probably, I think, one of the uh, easier targets that you can do for showing its weakness. How can you predict every future consequence? You know, oftentimes in ethics, you can say that when we're making moral choices, it's throwing a rock in the pond. Those ripples go all over, and you don't always know where they're going to go. So there's no way you can literally tell me what are all the consequences that are going to come out of this act because if you're saying the end justifies the means as long as it, it is a good consequence then you're going to do it. Well how do you know that? I'll talk more about that in a second. The last one is they don't even really talk about the intention. It doesn't matter. You're, just, you're getting a good grade. The end's good. All right, So you do it. I'll give you an example and then I'll give you something that ties consequentialism and proportionalism together. Any means? Uh, the second part of the first one, the criticism. This one? Yeah. It is not always possible to predict future consequences. Yeah, it must be hard for you to see over there. It is not always possible to predict future consequences. So here would be a consequentialist position. Let's say that we capture an ISIS combatant, and we're relatively sure that he has information that will save American and ally lives. So we are going to torture him slow and methodically until he gives us the information we want. Is torture and dehumanizing an individual an evil? Yes, but we're not concerned with that. According to consequentialism, we're really looking at what are the consequences, and the consequences are we might get information that's going to help save lives. All right. Um, part of the problem with that is, and let's you know, let's talk about future consequences, is you're setting a stage where the other person will now be allowed to do the same. Now, you might reply, well, they already do, all right? 
But let's use a different example. Let's say that this was, you know, um, one of the wars, you know, with, with Iraq. So when Iraq captures our guys, how do we know what effect that's going to have? Plus, let's not pretend that it doesn't affect the image and also the character of our nation. How far is that ripple going to go? Now we're a nation that employs any means to get to the ends that we want. So there's really no way, you know, in other words, you don't know all the consequences. You don't know how's that going to play out in history. I'll give you a real life scenario, and I'll remember the town. I'm pretty sure it was South America. But I remember reading this, and I was so upset that I didn't save it somewhere, because I've been searching for it every so often and can't find it. Here's the deal. There was this village in South America, and they were, it was a very poor village, and the main uh, means of them sustaining their lives was by fishing. They would eat fish, but they would also sell it in the markets. Well, they were working long days. The guys were out in the boats 14 hours a day fishing about the reef. What happens was outside uh, nations, environmentalists realized these people were depleting um, the fish population and also endangering the reef. So here we have a natural habitat that's going to be ruined if we don't step in and do something. So they decided the consequence that they wanted was them to stop fishing, but yet have a better um, way of living. So what they did was they set them up as pineapple plantation owners. They gave each family a plot, started them out. It turned out that instead of working 14 hours a day, these guys were working about nine hours a day. That's five hours less. It turns out they actually tripled their income. Isn't that a good outcome? Tripled their outcome, tripled their income, and they're working five hours less a day. But see, they, didn't, they don't think like Western capitalists. Most of us would think they're going to take the money and the extra time and invest it and grow their plantations. Turns out they were just quite content with how they were always living. And now they had five spare, spare hours a day to do something leisurely. Guess what they did with their leisure time? They fished. And went right back to depleting the reef again. Okay, now, is there anything evil that was redundant? No, that's not the point. My point is, the illustration is, you cannot predict all the future consequences of an action. So if you're making an ethical decision determined by the consequence, how do you really know that you've got it right? You really don't. Okay? You really don't. Okay. Deontology. This is uh, Immanuel Kant. For Immanuel Kant, everything was the will. Okay? So this ethic follows the categorical imperative, which means you have to discover a rule that's true always. Has anybody heard about categorical imperatives? Anybody? Second period was upset when I didn't know. They kept saying they let them down. Uh, an imperative is do this. You know, get up, put it away. Okay? As opposed to hypothetical as well, you can lose weight if you eat right, that kind of thing. So categorical is everywhere and always, imperative is, you know, a command. So what, you don't need to write this down, but Kant's categorical imperative was, I cannot will something unless I can will it universally. So um, is it good, is, can I lie? Well, no, because if I lie, then I have to say that everybody can lie, and that would just distort truth across society, and we'd have no basis for communication. So that became um, a, a duty, you cannot lie. All right. A couple bullet points are underneath it are it really focuses on the mood, motive. Do the right thing. And deontology is duty based. That's literally what the word deon, you don't need to know it, but deon in Greek means duty. So this is a duty based ethic. If you figure out what the duty is, you adhere to it. Okay? So the method they employ, there's only one more after this. If you want your act to be licit, you determine your duty or test it by asking whether that could be universally held. So cheating would be wrong because if you cheat, then everybody should be able to cheat, and everybody cheats. There's zero integrity in, a, in an assessment. Okay. So that's a good part. I mean, it's a good part that they're at least looking at the universality of a particular truth. But there's a criticisms that bring, we brought bear on this. It's really focusing on what you do, not what one should be. So we're not talking about character ethics here, like virtue ethics. 
we're just simply talking about following a rule or a duty. Okay. So the priority is really about doing what's right, not what's good. We're not talking about goods here. A good and a right are not synonyms. Probably the easiest criticism to bring to bear on this is, what happens if you have conflicting duties? What happens if you are, say, in the service, and you have to follow commands? One of your duties is, is that it's important that a superior officer is obeyed, because if, if you don't obey orders, then the whole system and hierarchy is going to collapse. So that's one of your universal duties. A categorical imperative would be you must follow orders. What if your superior officer gives you an order to lie? See, lying goes against the categorical imperative also because that would basically turn truth into nothing worth using as a, as a means to evaluate anything. So you have a conflicting duty here, and you don't know how to resolve it. You're probably going to fall back into proportionalism and try to do the one that's going to create the least havoc. But that's one of the issues. Okay. So what would be an example of duty? All right. Let's see who I can pick on today. Owen. Owen's on his front porch. He sees down the street this 10-year-old being chased by this big, hairy, mean guy with a knife. The kid's getting away. The kid gets behind the trees, comes up on through the porch and says, Mr. Double, you got to hide me. He says, get in the house. The guy's falling, but he wasn't sure which house he went into. He shows up on the porch, looks at Owen and says, did that kid come in here because I'm going to kill him? What would a deontologist have to say? Not what you'd want to say. What would a deontologist say? He's in there because you can't lie, all right? The, the example they often use would be like if you're hiding a Jew in World War II. A deontologist says, I can't lie, because if I lie, I have to universalize that. And I can't say it's good for everybody to lie. You might be thinking, but in this situation, the deontologist doesn't look at the situation. The deontologist looks at the duty. Once that duty has been determined and it's universal, then that's it. Nothing else needs to be considered, all right? By the way, just as an aside, what do you think the Catholic Church would say with the three fonts. What do you think in that case we would say is the what Owen is doing? What is the what that he's doing? Anybody want to guess? The kid's on the porch. He hides him in the house. The guy comes after him looking for the guy. Owen says he's... The object. Well, I'm asking you though, what is the object? Do you know? Oh. What would the object be? Like if you say, and, he, and he says, he's not in here. Owen says, he's not in here. Protecting. He's protecting. Okay, so he's pro the object is he's protecting the, the young kid. All right. Now you might say, well, that's a play in semantics or such. We could probably try to go back and forth as to define lying. Lying is typically known as a mental reservation, but there's other aspects around lying. Like one aspect to consider is whether or not the other person has any right to a truth. All right. So you might say, well, what could that be? Well, maybe somebody asked me something very personal about my wife or my daughter, and maybe they didn't try to force me to answer. I could lie because I know they have no right to that truth. They're not an authority over me, okay? So, in that sense. I know that sounds like it's semantics, but yes? Right, so I know you're saying in this situation you should, you have to tell them. But well, that's what the ontologist yeah. said, yes. But, but could you just say... Well, but see, your duty is to tell the truth. But you're not saying a lie, you're just saying you don't want to tell them. Which well, but they're asking you a flat out question. Is this child in there? You know the answer. Now, I'm not, see, you're, you're saying, you're probably trying to figure out what would you do in a situation. But a deontologist wouldn't think like that. A deontologist is going to say, what is my duty here? My duty is, the categorical imperative is to tell the truth. I have to tell the truth. Okay? That's how they'd approach it. Now, that might be a little bit of crass. There's nuances here, okay? but I'm just trying to show you a general idea of what they say. Okay, the last one, and then after this, we're just going to look at the scenario, is situational ethics. This is Joseph Fletcher. It's rather new, not maybe the application of this, but the development of it. He actually wrote a book that was titled just that, Situation Ethics. It's motivated solely by love. 
And you take all the particular circumstances of a situation into account. You know, this is probably the most popular one. Part of the goal here is, is that most people don't spend time evaluating an act. They're all over the board. Sometimes they're consequentialists, sometimes they're proportionalists, sometimes, most of the times, they're situational ethicists, okay? Sometimes, if they're devout, they'll understand what an intrinsic evil is. So you have to look at all the circumstances. Now, what is good about that? What's good about it is it's not just looking at the duty. It's taking all the situation. So, like you said, Ann, about there's certain circumstances here. Well, Joseph Flush is going to say that's exactly my point. You know, you have to take situation um, into account. A couple bullet points is it focuses on the uniqueness of each situation. They're all different, which means how can you know that they're all going to have the same application? So we have to have flexible guidelines, not rigid principles. Lying is bad, says Joseph Fletcher, but it's not rigid. You've got to be flexible with it as a principle, depending on the situation. In the situation they're on your porch, that would be okay. okay. So flexible guidelines rather than rigid principles. The method that they use, if I'm going to decide on an action, I will follow these general guidelines rather than those principles and my goal is to achieve the well-being of others. So there would be no question whatsoever what to do if Owen was on his porch and that guy came and said he's in here. Owen's going to say, in this situation, lying is fine, even though we've defined it as not lying. They, they said it's not even, we don't even really look at that. And the well-being of that individual, and maybe in the community, it's best that I just do it, all right? Um, I'm going to give you a real story, and I'm going to give you, well, oh, I'm not done yet. I've got to give you the criticisms. Getting ahead of myself. Here are the three criticisms. And I, I just did this last night, so I, sometimes, you know, I think of this, but I, I didn't really have a thought of a better way to put it, so I must have nailed it, at least in my mind for today. If love is the motivation, then this is going to be a consequentialist type ethics, and it is. Joseph Fletcher recognized that. There's going to be times where there's no doubt. Even though we're doing it for love, the end justifies the means. You know, for the love of humanity, which I want to save this young child, no matter what I do, it saves them. Okay? One of the other problems is, what exactly is the definition of love here? It's like happiness. You know, we're not really defining it in these scenarios. Love here is the best vague. It's probably more of a sentimentality. Whatever you feel it is, that's what it is. All right? The other idea is that ethical results are going to vary. And when they vary, that's always an injustice. Anytime you have a double standard. Like, for instance, I know someone who counseled. They were talking about this. They said, oh, I know you're an ethicist, Steve. Tell me what you think. They counseled a woman who was in, a, in an abusive relationship. She was getting hit. They counseled her to get out of the relationship. Okay, now. We all would do that, all right? So we're not, at the, we're not at the ethical dilemma point yet. But within weeks, there was a guy, not that she was having sexual relations during her marriage, but he was kind of her support through all this all. And this man then, and she did say after she left him, she was with that other guy, and they did start a sexual relationship, and this gentleman said, I think that's fine in this particular case because your well-being is important. He was supportive. The fact that you started a sexual relationship is not really the issue. Okay, now that's the issue. Because now it's, we've gone from getting this woman to a safe place to adultery. But they're not looking at the adultery. They're looking at the motivation of love and well-being. And they're looking at this particular situation. Now, why do I say that there can be an injustice? Because what if there was some other scenario where that same person counts the person, you can't go and live with them. Why? Because you, you, you had sex with them before you even left. Why does that change anything? All of a sudden, you, you're, you don't have a standard to apply. Since you're using a vague love as a motivation, and you're looking at the circumstances, you have something you know, that's a little hard there to be even with. So you, it's inevitable that you're going to have some sort of misjustice. Here's an example Joseph Fletcher uses, and I can't remember the specific names. There must have been a concentration <coughs> camp during World War II in Germany or nearby, in Poland or such, 
that it was not a death camp yet at this point. The, this family um, were in imminent danger of being captured. The husband and the children, young children, made it out. I think they made it to Austria before they were caught. The wife was caught. The wife was imprisoned in the camp. You could be released from this camp on certain medical conditions. One of them was with if you're pregnant. She bribed the um, guard into having sex with her until she conceived. Once her conception was uh, identified, then she was released or put on lighter you know, security. She managed to escape across the border and once again meet up with her family. And she explained to her husband what she did, and he forgave her because of this. So Joseph Fletcher says, in that situation, adultery is wrong, but that's a rigid principle. We're going to be flexible. Given the circumstances and the situation, it seems like that was the right thing to do. Okay. What would be the object of the act, according to the Catholic Church, in that situation? Get back to the family? No. That would be her intention. What is the object? Adultery. Adultery. Adultery is an intrinsic evil. Okay, so some um, immediately you're thinking, as I did when I first hear this, right? Well, so you're saying that she needs to stay there and suffer the consequences. Okay, that's a tragedy that she has to stay there, but yes. Now somebody would say, well, I wouldn't. Okay, let me give you another scenario. You're fighting in battle, and you're so worried about getting killed because it looks like your whole platoon is going to get wiped out. You manage to scurry away cowardly, get out of the country, get notice to your wife and family, you reunite, they understand what you did. Could you imagine if we had people doing that in war? Could you imagine if we had people applying situational ethics to Christianity as far as martyrdom? We would have no martyrs. If you were, in a, if you were married with your little kids you're in another country and you were captured because you're a Christian and they were threatening you to kill you if you did not renounce your God, you might be thinking, well, can I just renounce him and go home and tell my wife what I did and ask for forgiveness? Well, you could, but we'd have no Christian martyrs ever. You know, if you read early church history, the only reason Christianity grew is because people couldn't believe that there was actually something worth dying for. So the phrase goes, if there's nothing to live for, only there's nothing to live for, only there's nothing to die for. In other words, people fought for our freedom because they thought there was something worth dying for, right? Christianity is worth adhering to because there's something worth dying for. The sanctity of marriage is something enough that yes, even tragically, that's worth dying for. So it seems like it's rigid, but the Catholic Church would look at this to say that's a wonderful intention. They would look at the circumstances and say those are extraordinary circumstances. But none of those justify the end. All right? Okay. Any questions on that before we apply these? Okay. So once again, it's the same exact story as you had yesterday. And if you remember, the object of the act here was cheating. The intention was she wanted to get a good grade and she wanted to be loving and pleasing to her parents. And the circumstances were that Jesse um, wasn't as good at math as Gloria, but Jesse was a better test taker. Gloria was not. Gloria usually helped Jesse, but this time she's not, do he's, she's not doing so well, so she cheats. All right, and she gets a good score. How would proportionalism do this? What are the evils here? What can you identify as one of the evils in this story? Does anybody remember? She cheated. What would be the goods? She got a good grade. What else? She, her parents. We could probably even like you know add to it. Maybe she's going to you know get a good GPA, which is going to give her a good scholarship, which means she's going to go to a good college that her parents otherwise couldn't afford. Maybe she'll even be very successful and help out her own family. I mean, so the proportionalist is going to weigh it all out and say, this is a no-brainer. You know, just cheat. It's not that big of a deal. The goods outweigh all that, okay? A consequentialist, there's no sense to even trying to debate it. The ends justify the means. You want to cheat, lie, whatever you want to do, you, you wound up at a good end. And that's what's important. We don't look at the means to get there. We don't evaluate that. We only evaluate it by the consequence in the end. How about the deontologist? What would the deontologist say? Yeah. 
So he would say, even if somebody said, well, what about if the girl wound up not getting a good GPA? What if she wound up getting almost no money for scholarship? What if she had to go to school for like eight years as she went part-time? The deontologist says, but her duty is the categorical imperative, which is if you can't will for everybody to cheat, then you can't cheat, all right? One other thing before we go on to the situ to situational ethics is, what are the other consequences that we have not even thought of? It destroys the integrity of the, the assessment. I had a friend once that lied about what college you went to on, in, on a, um, an, a, an application. You got a job. Consequentials is no problem. Proportionalist is all the good that came out of it. You got a good job. So what? Right? But what other consequences don't we know? Who didn't get the job? What changed in their life? Plus now, and this was before we had internet, so you couldn't check all this stuff so easily. We have no idea how far those ripples went out, okay? So we don't know all the consequences. We only know the immediate ones. We don't know these people are going to start fishing again once they get five hours more of leisure time. You don't know those things. How about the situational ethics? What would Joseph Fletcher say here? What motivated her to do this? It says right here, the love and support. If you're motivated by love and support, Joseph Fletcher would say cheating's bad, but it's not the rigid rule that you think it is. It's flexible. In these circumstances, it's probably fine. So the moral fonts and deontology would fall that this is an illicit act, proportionalism, consequentialism, and situational ethics, which is a type of consequentialism, they're kind of all utilitarian ethics, would say this is totally illicit. All right. Do you get that? Does it seem easy enough? Okay. That's it, guys.